mean to live a righteous life? The Old Testament lesson from Exodus accounts the Ten Commandments as given to Moses. We hear at least Sunday during Lent as a reminder of how our life should be oriented. It can feel constrictive, this list of thou shalt not. It's a curious thing then to hear the psalmist today speak of the law of the Lord reviving the soul and rejoicing the heart. Giving wisdom I can understand, giving life I'll buy, but rejoicing feels like a stretch. But when we consider that the Ten Commandments were originally given to help a bunch of former slaves know how to stay in right relationship with God and how to be in right relationship with one another, it begins to make some sense. For a bunch of folks who've been lived on the margins, persecuted and paranoid, the commandments were a gift to keep the wandering tribes of Israel together, to help them learn what it was to be a community living in covenant with the living God. The commandments make it clear that being in a right relationship with God and being in a right relationship with one's neighbors is inseparable. Remember Jesus' summary of the law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> we cannot be in right relationship with God if we do not also honor the image of God in which we and our neighbors are created. That's how it works. That's why... Of the Ten Commandments, four govern our relationship with the divine, and six govern our relationship with others bearing the divine image and likeness. When we covet, when we steal, or bear false witness, or commit adultery, or murder, we fail to honor the image of God in which our neighbors are made. We dishonor them, and in doing so, we dishonor ourselves. A consequence we seldom think of when we sin against someone else is that in addition to tearing the fabric of community, in addition to hurting that person, taking their dignity as a human being created in the image and likeness of God, we also diminish the image of God in ourselves. It's a challenge to recognize and respect the image of God in every person especially when people look different, or sound different, or think differently, or worship differently. It was that way in the Old Testament times, too. The law was a heavy load to bear. Few people could meet the standard, but there was a system that allowed folks to start over. The system of sacrifice. <coughs> Originally, sacrifices were the way people ritually celebrated God's providence through offering of the first fruits of the earth, of grain and livestock in the womb. One could also offer sacrifice to atone for sins known and unknown, just to cover your bases. So if you'd sinned against another, or were remiss in any holy thing, you would present your offering to the priest, who would make atonement on your behalf, and you would be forgiven. Sacrifices were ways for people to ritualize gratitude and regret <clears throat> and be restored to right relationship with God. You might imagine when there was a festival and the number of people in Jerusalem swelled with the faithful who had gathered for the celebration, there was a lot of activity at the temple. Pilgrims would take the opportunity to offer sacrifice to be forgiven for their sins. On those occasions, there was great demand for cattle and sheep and doves. Enter Jesus. Now, we're, beginning, we're near the beginning of John's Gospel. John the baptizer has borne witness to Jesus, declaring, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Next, Jesus gathers some disciples to him. On the third day, there's a wedding in Cana. You remember that party. To those of us who have read through to the end of the story, the mention of the third day should get our attention. Then 
when the wine runs out and Mary wants Jesus to do something about it, he tells her, my hour has not yet come. The hour being more code. But he eventually provides an abundance of the beverage for the celebration, and the steward commends the bridegroom. Bridegroom is more biblical code. We are barely into the second chapter of John, and already the text is littered with words and phrases which will be revealed to have special meaning later. The Lamb of God, the third day, the hour, the bridegroom, all point us to Jesus, to his death and resurrection, and his coming again. When Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the Passover, he heads straight to the temple. There he witnesses the trading of cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers at their tables. And he makes a whip out of cords and he chases the whole lot off the temple grounds. He drives out the sheep and the cattle, he tells the dove sellers to get out, and he turns over the tables of the money changers and their coins end up all over the ground. And he declares, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Those looking on may well have thought that Jesus had lost it. <laughs> but we know. We know that Jesus is saying, no more. No more sacrifices. No more killing. He drives out the animals that would be sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. Why? Because they're no longer needed. Jesus is the final the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not just once, but once and for all. As some of you know, I began this week on Monday night at a vigil for Kelly Grissender. Grissender, Danner, sorry. I've been sitting with her story and the scriptures this week. You may have heard her story on the news. Kelly conspired with her boyfriend to murder her husband, Doug, in 1997. And then to give herself a solid alibi was out dancing with friends as he was stabbed and killed. In the intervening years, she's accepted responsibility and shown remorse for her part in his murder. She has reconciled with her children and she has sought to be a positive model and resource for other inmates, mentoring many, challenging and encouraging them to be their best selves. And she speaks with young people, trying to keep them from making the same mistakes that she made. It is tragic that it took a heinous crime in prison for Kelly to come to herself. The grace she has found is costly. It demands honesty, and courage, and inner strength. It requires acknowledging one's faults, and then following Jesus in a new life that leads to transformation, even in the inhospitable soil of a prison yard. But the fruits of transformation and redemption in her life are unmistakable. Even behind bars, Kelly seeks to be fully human and to help others be fully human too. Those of us of faith might say that being fully human means honoring the divine image and likeness in which we and others are made. Which brings me back to where I started. What does it mean to live a righteous life? To be in right relationship with God and neighbor. What does it mean, not just for you and me, but for Kelly and others whose sins are horrific and public? It seems to me that there are two theological questions at stake here for those of us who identify as followers of the crucified and risen one. First, we believe that all people are created in the image and likeness of God. Scripture tells us that. But what about those who act against the human dignity of others? 
those who have dishonored the image of God and others and in so doing distorted the image of God and themselves, can they still reflect the divine image? Or have they forfeit that right by their actions? And in the wake of grievous offenses against God and neighbor, is it possible for us to be restored? To reflect again the image and likeness of God? My other wonderings concern what we believe about redemption. In the ancient world, the spilling of blood atoned for sin. Do we still believe that to be true? Some Jewish scholars argue that capital punishment is a favor for the capital sinner, a form of atonement and redemption. Ironically, especially vile murderers are denied execution because they are regarded as beyond redemption through capital punishment. Can that be right? Can dying from one's sins, for one's transgressions, be redemptive for the perpetrator of violence? Is it redemptive for the victims? For their surviving loved ones? Does God really require our death, the shedding of our blood, for our own redemption? <clears throat> Ezekiel and other prophets tell us over and over that God has no pleasure in the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. And Psalm 51 reminds us that the sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit. A broken and contrite heart of God, you will not despise. My friends, the sacrifice has already been made on our behalf. Jesus, the Lamb of God, holy and blameless, freely gave his life for us, for all. Redemption is by God's action, not ours. By God's faithfulness, not ours. It is God's love and grace and mercy that redeems us, not ours. This is the foolishness that Paul speaks of, the embarrassment of Christ crucified being the good news to sinners who believe. My sisters and brothers, our sacrifice is our own brokenness. Our troubled spirits offered to God and redeemed and made perfect in the love and mercy and grace of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. We need not die. No one needs to die for redemption. We need only turn from our wickedness and live. And foolishness or not, I count that as very good news indeed. Amen. Amen.